Hello and welcome to Homes at Home. I'm Evan Mosey and my dad, Todd Mosey, works at Michigan Secret. Today, we're going to start by talking about the five Great Lakes known by the acronym HOMES. Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior. Today, we're going to jump up to the S, Superior, in the Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore, where my dad had an artist in residence for watercolor painting. Thanks, Evan. Appreciate the introduction. I'm just up here at Lake Superior, hanging out at the beach. Not really, but today I'm going to tell you a little bit about Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore. A lakeshore is basically a national park, but it's along a lake or water. So in 2017, I was invited to be the artist of residence. So I lived up here at Pictured Rocks um, at the park in a cabin. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what was involved in that, show you some photos that inspired me from my hiking over through the area. And then after that, I'll be giving a little demo on how to create a four by six watercolor uh, by using many materials that you'll find around your home. So first I'll tell you a little bit about the park. Pitchard Rocks National Lakeshore stretches 42 miles along the shore from Munising to Grand Marais, Michigan. Some of its greatest features are multicolored sandstone cliffs that rise above its brilliant blue-green waters and world-class sand dunes. Like this, this is Grand Sable Dunes. If you like sandboxes, you'll want to come straight here. The lakeshore is also home to deep wood hiking trails and trails that hug Lake Superior. It has many campgrounds, beaches, and waterfalls. These all inspired my artwork, which you'll see here. Where in the world is Pitchard Rocks National Lakeshore? It's on Lake Superior in Michigan. This map will show you how big the park is. The main park office is in Munising. This area of the park is closer to the limestone cliffs. And about an hour drive northeast is the other end of the park, near Grand Marais, which has sand dunes and a lighthouse. Next is the log cabin I lived in for three weeks. Sullivan Cabin is far away from the towns. The only neighbors are wildlife. The cabin is across the street from Lake Superior. The closest house was 20 minutes away. There was no electricity except for solar power to power the lights and there was no phone service or no internet. Now you know where Pitchard Rocks is at Lake Superior, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my art and how I create textures and shapes. So um, here's an example of what we'll be doing today. But on a... Texture and color are some of the elements in my art that make it interesting. I study nature and then try to mimic or copy what I see. I've experimented with different materials that help me create natural looking shapes on my art. Here are some ideas on how to get these common materials from around your house. Happy birthday, Lion! Here's your gift. Yeah. Ooh, bubble wrap and tissue paper! I'm gonna make some artwork! Wait, Ryan, don't, don't recycle it quite yet. Let's check it for materials that we can use in watercolor. Oh, this would make a neat pattern. And here, this too. What about wax paper? Stuff that used to hold fruit. I think a lot of this looks nice. Let's bring it in and use it. Materials such as wax paper, tissue paper, and saran wrap will create a rock-like pattern when dry. Bubble wrap and crepe paper, like the stuff you have when, at a birthday party, that'll create a similar result. Cheesecloth, nylons, and the spider web cotton from Halloween can create root-like textures, so it looks like it's a tree. Can you think of other things that might make a texture? If so, give it a try. If it doesn't work, that's okay. Just keep trying and keep your eyes out for other materials around the house. This effect here was made by 
old nylons or the spider web cottony stuff that you see around Halloween, which is a very cool effect. Um, you have to pull that stuff apart and then put it down on your on your board. I'll show you how to do that later, but just showing you right now some materials and how how they might uh, turn out. This I received in the mail. It's just plastic. This weird plastic. I'm like, hmm, I wonder what that'll look like. So I put it down on my paper, let it dry, pull it off, and that's what happens with plastic. There's also this kind of mesh stuff that you sew with. You can use that. And you get this kind of effect. It's pretty cool, isn't it? It's amazing what you can, what you can get from uh, things that are laying around the house. Speaking of materials, specifically wax paper, these photos show where I get my inspiration from. One of my favorite big things to do is to take a tour boat to see the huge rock formations from the water. From the boat, I saw 200-foot cliffs literally dripping with textures and colors. Streaks on the cliffs came from minerals in groundwater seeping out of the rock and evaporating, which leaves the colors of red, which is iron, black, white, which is manganese, yellow, brown, limonite, and copper, which can be pink and green. On top of the cliffs were trees, blue sky, and down below was brilliant blue-green water. I wanted to paint that, and so I did. In contrast to the big things on Lake Superior, small things deserve just as much attention. When I'm hiking or walking along the beach, I like to look at the ground for little things like stones, textures of the rock or sand, mushrooms, and mosses. Does anyone like beaches? Me too. Lake Superior has both rocky beaches and sandy beaches. The best thing about being an artist at the park was having the time to study how nature works. I literally watched water come out of the rocks, then followed the path to the lake, while noting the shapes and colors. I wondered how these geologic formations were sculpted. All that thinking inspired me to get back to the log cabin, my new art studio, and paint. Oh, before I get back to the studio, I have to mention how amazing rock hunting is. I collected colorful rocks from the cold water to study. I took some pictures and put them back on the beach when I was done. That was hard to do, but I wanted to make sure that other visitors got to see them too. What does an artist in residence do? Well, they create art that is inspired by what they see or feel around the park. The artist in residence is considered a national park volunteer and are asked to give a public presentation about the experience of living and creating art at the park. We also talk to park visitors about our art and its relationship with nature. At the end of the project, the artist donates a piece of art to the National Park Art Collection. It's an honor to know that the U.S. government owns one of my paintings. So basically, while I was an artist at the park, I took this experience and turned it into this painting. Some artists like to create art on location, which is called plain air. Not me. Since my technique requires long drying time, I prefer to experience my surroundings, take pictures, then go back to the art studio and paint, usually at night, like this picture. I think the local forest bear took this photo. And now for a quick art demonstration. With the techniques I use, you will have to allow drying time of up to an hour, so feel free to take notes or replay this video again. The Homes at Home challenge for today is to create some art or watercolor, take a picture, tag Michigan Sea Grant, and that's at M-I-S-E-A-G-R-A-N-T, or email us. Here are the essential supplies you will need. Board, cardboard, foam board, something flat and sturdy that can handle a bit of water. The thicker the better. You might have to tape a few layers of cardboard together so it won't bend when wet. You also need some painter's tape, which is the best because it peels off nicely without uh, ripping the paper, but masking tape will also do. You'll need a cup for water, brushes, an old towel, watercolor paper, I prefer a 140 pound cold press, 
has 90 pound buckles easily and you'll also need watercolor paint at least the primary colors red blue and yellow if you have a dried paint set remember to add water to the paint about five minutes before starting a project to soften the paint the first step is to tape down your watercolor paper I'm using pre-cut 4x6 postcard size papers, but you can use any size paper that you could find. Uh, paper that is in the block form is economical and you can tear off the sheets when you need them. I prefer to tape the paper on gator board, foam board. Uh, foam board will do, but it might buckle when wet. If you do use foam board, uh, tape several of those uh, foam boards together to give it more strength. Plywood boards are even better if you have them laying around. But uh, first off, get your paper and tape all the way around it so it's down secure. Now that the paper is secure, I'm going to lightly wet the paper with my brush, which will let my paint spread easier. This is called wet on wet. If the paper were dry and you added your color, the color would only stay where you put down your brush. It wouldn't spread. Think about the textured material you have collected and decided to use. I'm going to use wax paper, but again, you could substitute bubble wrap or the material of your choice. I like to tear it into a rectangle-like shape with some jagged edges at the bottom. This represents a cliff, a rock formation, or land. Here is a finished example of the wax paper technique. In order to get interesting rock-like shapes, you will have to create air pockets in your waxed paper. Put a few creases in the paper and maybe crumple up some small sections and leave other sections flat. This will give it some interest once we peel this off after it dries. Red orange is put down on the paper. This represents the iron that is inside the rocky cliff. I often dab a little bit of a darker paint in with my first color. Now it's time to put the wax paper on the paint. I press down here and there so there's a bit of a suction with the paint and the paper. Here's the fun part. Well, it's all fun, but I like watching this happen. I choose a darker color with my brush and feed it in the wrinkles in the wax paper. You can see the color travel along the air pockets. I will now add some blue for sky and then green on the opposite side. They will blend together in the middle and then I will sneak in a little bit of green towards the bottom under the wax paper and that will kind of work its way into the air pockets and um, create a really nice blended effect once it dries. The next, I will sprinkle some salt up at the top uh, near the sky, and where the salt drops, it will um, pretty much push away the pigment and then create a star-like effect. The hard part is letting it dry completely. This is important because if you peel the wax paper off too soon, it will look fuzzy and the paint may run together. It's best to let it dry for at least one hour, maybe more, but when it is time, peel it very slowly. Sometimes the wax paper will stick to the watercolor paper, so you want to try to pull all that off. At this point, the painting looks a little flat. I will study the painting for composition and interesting shapes, then enhance or pop them out with medium or dark colors. I'm basically outlining the shapes with a darker color, then I get a brush with clean water and draw the color out so it turns into a fade. It gives the shapes more value or shading. As you can see here, this pulls it out. If it gets into um, a color that you don't want to, you can always dab it with a towel and that basically acts as an eraser. I'm going to develop the uh, rocks a little bit more by adding some more shading. Uh, but I'm going to try not to overdo it. I've done all the rocky bits for now, and I will add some design elements by tracing a coin. 
Circles, planets, and moons, along with trees, are themes that I often use in my art. To me, it's a soothing shape, and it helps guide or attract the eye of the viewer. I will put in a few circles in this painting, a large and a small. Just to be different, I will add a moon inside of the smaller circle. I'm tracing with my coaster, but you can find many different size circle, square, or rectangle lids that you can use as a template, simply in your recycling bin. As mentioned earlier, I will pop in some trees at the top of this cliff in hopes I will convey a Great Lake shoreline as seen from the water. Instead of painting the trees on a flat line, I will add some interest to the painting by adding a silhouette of the tree line behind the moon and circle. Instead of painting a crescent moon, I will invert or reverse the moon shape. I like sparkly metallic watercolor. If you don't have that in your set, another option is to water down acrylic or craft metallic paint. I hope these examples give you a splash of inspiration on ways you can be inspired by our Great Lakes. Please stick around for question and answers, but first, thanks to my boys Evan and Ryan for helping me film, for acting in this video, and helping me choose photos and art. I kind of feel like they are homeschooling me on this video. I just want to repeat a few important ideas about art. If you don't have the art supplies that I mentioned earlier, you can still complete our Homes at Home Challenge by using crayon, chalk, or colored pencils. Tempera paint or acrylic can also be watered down and used with some similar effects. Art can be fun, but also a little frustrating sometimes. My paintings don't always turn out okay. I put it in a pile and start over again. Remember to look around your home for interesting textured materials to put on your paper. Next time you are outside, take a look around the small places, the things that no one else looks at. You may find something interesting and it might inspire you to create some art. When you are done with your Great Lakes inspired art, tag us at MIC Grant or email us at msgpubs at unish.edu. Everyone, thanks again for joining today. Hope you enjoyed the video on uh, how to create some artwork. And uh, we're going to take some questions here. Hi everybody, this is Geneva popping in from Ann Arbor, Michigan. I'm Todd's co-worker at Michigan Sea Grant and I live just a few minutes away from him on the other side of town. I've got some questions from you guys um, to, to pass on to Todd. Uh, we have one person in the comments saying that she was glad that your boys could be part of the video. Um, have they, what have they done with video projects before? Was this new for them? Well, my, my youngest son, Ryan, he's nine he loves making little videos he does stop motion video um but this is the first full length feature film i think that that he's done uh so i'm looking forward to doing some more he's he's really good at it and i'm learning a lot from him you guys make a good team uh prue is wondering how long you've been painting i've had a um I've been painting probably since college, but I've, I've been interested in art ever since I was a little kid. Uh, there's pictures of me when I was probably two years old with, with crayons. Uh, I tried coloring everything and anything in the house, including uh, a little Volkswagen I had. It was like something that you ride, and I tried coloring that green with, with my green crayon. Um, but um, yeah, I've been, been really into art my whole life. But uh, I got into actual painting when I was in college. Uh, before that, I did uh, drawings with just pen and ink or, or marker. There certainly are a lot of good ways to be creative. Thanks for showing us one of them right here. Um, Amy is wondering, what's the weirdest material you've used to create texture in one of your paintings? I think um, like the old nylons, that's a, that's a weird one. Um, you, because you can you can get it. I don't think I have any here, but you basically get a nylon and you have to stretch it and poke holes in it, and you get this really 
really neat, neat shape. But I'd say, now, and actually, the second, the second weirdest is um, snakeskin. I was up at the 4-H camp last summer in Alpena, and where I was giving an art demonstration at, at the cabin, we walked outside, and there was a snake just sitting out there, and he had just peeled its skin. So we, we brought it in and popped it down on a painting. And if you have something that's a little uh, bumpy, you want to put something heavy on it, like a, a book or something like that. It'll take extra time to, to dry, like maybe a day, um, but it's really worth it. Had a really cool snake skin appearance after we peeled it off. It's a good way to make use of materials that show up unexpectedly in your life. Um, we have a question on Zoom wondering if you can show us the final product of the painting you were working on in the video. Oh, it's it's actually on my board back there. I can't I can't really get it. Well, maybe I can grab it. All right, cool. <laughs> so while while Todd is running over to grab his art, don't forget we've got a couple more minutes for questions. Awesome, there it is. Thanks for showing us that. I really like how that moon turned out. You know what though? It might not be totally final. Um, I'm pretty good at letting something sit. And then, you know, sometimes it speaks to me and I can add a little bit more. Um, so I, I think that might happen with this painting. Well, people might just have to watch the Michigan Sea Grant Facebook page for, for evidence of the final product whenever it emerges. Um, we've got more questions to ask. Um, Adam is wondering, what's your favorite color? My favorite color is green, um, but it, you know, I think sometimes it depends on the day, um, but I think the common color themes in my, my painting or the color combinations, green, purple, blue, uh, that's pretty typical. Um, but sometimes you have to, you have to try other colors. Um, a good story from uh, when I was in graduate school, my, um, my instructor came in one day and said, you know what, Todd, I think um, here, here's, a, here's a plan for you. I want you to do a painting without using your favorite colors. Use your lonely colors. And she picked up a, a, um, a yellow and a red and an orange, and I had never opened those tubes up. And she said, I want you to do some paintings with those. And man, that was hard at first, but um, it, it was a good, it was a good, great suggestion. I'm glad that, that uh, she had me do that assignment because um, it kind of gets you out of your, your box, your comfort level. And so as an artist, it's good to keep, you know, keep doing different things. Maybe that's inspiration for people who have paints or crayons or colored pencils at home. Look for the crayons that aren't as stubby or the colored pencils that aren't as, as worn down or the paints that are, are more full in the bottle and try using those, see what you can make. Um, we're running low on time for questions, but we'll squeeze in just a couple more. Um, so you got to live up in pictured rocks for just a little bit. What would be the next park you would want to visit and paint? Oh boy, I would love to go back there again. Um, but I think the next one I'd like to do is Sleeping Bear. Uh, Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore also has an artist in residence. And um, someday I hope to do that one. I'm, I don't mean to stick in the state of Michigan, but it's just so awesome. There's so many great things in our Great Lakes state. But um, that's definitely on my list of places to go next. Very cool. So I am going, to, I know we're a little bit over time, but I want to squeeze in one more question from Stuart. Uh, besides the artist in residence, what kinds of other people live at national parks? Well, there are the park rangers who, who live up there and they have, um, at Pitcher Rocks, for example, they have probably, uh, I think, five different homes and apartment apartments spread throughout the park. So um, I'd say that's the, the park rangers are are the other other folks. But you also have uh, campers who live there temporarily. Uh, Pitcher Rocks has, I think, three or four main campgrounds, um, and most of them don't have electricity, so you have to. When you're camping out there, it's it's real camping. So. That sounds like the best kind of adventure, and hopefully one that we can still do this summer. 
Um, so we are over time right now. Todd, if people want to find out more about you and your art, where can they go to find that information? Yeah, you can go to um, Marcy Gallery. That's M as in Mary, A-R-S-E-E, -E, and gallery.com. And if you want to read more about the, um, the artist's residence, just put a slash blog at the end, and that'll take you right to um, some information on what other things I did up there. And also has a, a feature on our freshwater feasts, which talks about Great Lakes whitefish and some recipes. Awesome. So I put the link to that up in the, the comments in the Zoom chat window if anyone wants to go check that out. Well, thank you so much, Todd. This was really awesome. And I hope people are inspired to go create some awesome Great Lakes art. And as Todd said, feel free to email us at msgpubs at umich.edu or tag us on social media if you upload it. We'd love to see what you're creating. And don't forget to tune in on Thursday at 1030. We're going to have a guest on who can talk about exciting ways to help science right in your backyard through an activity called a bio blitz. So join us at 1030 on Zoom or Facebook Live to learn more about that. Thanks, everyone. Have a good morning. Thank you. Bye.